to talk about the two most senior Church of England clerics, the two primates. The Archbishops of York and Canterbury have claimed Muslim communities are at risk of vilification over the forthcoming revised definition of extremism that is set to be unveiled by Michael Gove. Their graces published a joint statement warning that the definition, which aims to embolden institutions against the threat of extremism, could vilify the wrong people. The government should be careful what it wishes for, as it's well known that the Prevent programme added me and other Conservative commentators to a list of far-right red flags. What would stop a Labour government weaponising this extremism definition against legitimate Conservative voices? Well, I'm very pleased to be joined now by barrister and columnist for Perspective, Sam Files, as well as my most pugnacious panel, former editor of The Sun, Kelvin McKenzie, and the historian and broadcaster, Tessa Dunlop. Um, Sam, these types of definitions, from a legal perspective, mm. are very difficult, aren't they? Because you want to... You, you sort of know who an extremist is when you see it, but once you try writing it down, <laughs> you may get a lot of people who are just exercising freedom of speech. Well, quite. And that's the, the problem with extremism. H historically, extremi extremism has always meant something that the people in power don't like and consider a bit beyond the pale. The, the existing extremism definition is very woolly. The new extremism definition is likely to be even more woolly and potentially can encompass almost anything. And that gives an enormous amount of power, discretionary power, to politicians, to the executive, to essentially use against the people they don't like, and that can be really problematic. And essentially, unless you're proposing the violent overthrow of the state, mm. you should be able to say pretty much what you like, shouldn't you? That the Scottish nationalists and Plaid Cymru have a view that they're entitled to hold, even though it would break up the country as we know it. Absolutely, that, that must be right. I'd, I'd perhaps add one more caveat to mm. that, which is, unless you're advocating the violent overthrow of the country or violence against any people in the country. I think that's right. Um, but you have to have this, uh, this sort of open debate. Well, I'll just ask you the question of violence against any individual. Um, it's legitimate to campaign that I'm not in favour of it for the death penalty. That's a difficult point. I think it is legitimate to campaign for it. It is wrong to, yes, to I campaign agree. I think, for it. I think capital punishment is um, morally indefensible, but I don't think it's... But you... But... I think there's a difference between campaigning for something that is changing the law and putting something on a statutory basis and in a structure and saying, because I hate this particular group, because I think this particular group is a threat, these, these people are, are traitors, these people are a threat to our children, you should be violent against them. There's a, there's a, a clear difference between those, those two different types of campaigns. And I think one, we have to make space for even if we don't particularly like it. The other, we don't have to make space. For. And that's the key thing, that it's very easy to dismiss anyone you disagree with as being an extremist and saying that their views undermine the fabric of the nation. Uh, but actually, you undermine the fabric of the nation pretty quickly if you prohibit freedom of speech. Well, absolutely. I, I was accused of undermining the fabric of the, of the nation when I uh, defended MPs uh, in the prorogation case. And when I argued for the restoration of Parliament, I was accused of undermining democracy, which, under the, the new definition of, uh, of extremism, would potentially label me as an extremist. And because I was on completely the other side on that, I was an extremist in the other direction. <laughs> well, quite. And it depends who wins, doesn't Lock it? Lock them both yes. up. That's <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Tessa. The, the voice of reason. <laughs> Well, it's, it's very confusing, this. I was, woke up, actually, to um, His Grace, Arch, um, Bishop, Archbishop, is that yes, Archbishop, yes. Yeah, Archbishop yeah. Canterbury, um, on the radio this morning, worrying he was out loud about the current level of political discourse, uh, which he added on at the end of his sermon, effectively, countering this idea of new definitions of extremism, which would hollow out the middle ground. Why on earth would we want to do that? You need to capture as many people as you can in the middle. And once you start banning groups and cordoning people off, that's where danger lies. Well, doesn't it actually make the middle ground the only ground if you try and ban extremism? Because you, 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 if you think of a bell curve, the bits at the very end you just make illegal and therefore everyone's happy I, in the middle. I, I, to be honest with you, I, I would wish that the Archbishop of Canterbury would spend a little more time worrying about not Islam in our country, but worrying about Christians facing Islam in Africa, where they're being chased out, persecuted, denied food, and you hear nothing about that. But he spends, but he thinks there's some political gain to be made in a in 
it, it, the Church of England has lost 50% of its congregation in, the, in a decade, right? When you get people like Welby getting involved in this very narrow, and I agree with you, by the way, quite wrong, completely wrong, trying to def define extremism, it will be thrown out by Labour, by the way, even, even, if, even, if, uh, even if it goes through which I have my doubts, right? Even if it goes through, we haven't even seen it yet. Why is he bothering to join in? Worry about the Christians in Africa no. and do not worry about the about the three and a half to four million Muslims in our country who are quite capable of speaking for themselves. You, you quite miss the point of having an established church. I mean, he sits in the Lords. He is one of our bishops. He's actually a seasoned voice of reason and he talks about communities within communities, and he's able to reach out to those communities. I've seen him stand with leading members of the Muslim and the Jewish community yeah, recently, right, since the attacks right, in October, and speak I, with credibility and authority. They're, they're, I want him in the room uh, for these I, we sh I agree we shouldn't have this extremist. What I don't like him is completely talking for Muslims and forgetting, I think, about well, Christians. So, so I want to bring you in on the issue of hate crimes and um, non-crime hate speech. How mm. should you deal with that? Well... I think what uh, the, the Labour Party are proposing is, is a little bit more sensible. I'm not fully endorsing it, but what the Labour Party are proposing is to record non-crime hate incidents. And so that is a, a hate crime, and just to be, be clear, a hate crime is when you commit a crime for a discriminatory purpose because you hate someone because they're gay or they're black or, or whatever. Um, Non-hate incidents are when you do something hateful that's not a crime. The reason it's important to record this is because you see patterns. And when you're policing, when you're trying to protect people from the dangers of violent extremism, and we do have violent extremism in this country, my, my colleagues have been uh, threatened with knives, attacked with knives, because they've been accused of, of uh, standing up for immigrants. Um, when, you, when you're trying to protect people from this sort of violent extremism, you need to watch the pattern. And so that's a sensible way to go about this. But isn't that the same risk, that people saying things mm -hmm. that are in support of their faith, and whether it be Islam or of Christianity, may find that they are saying things that offend people? And then do you say mm -hmm. that is a hate mm -hmm. incident rather than mm -hmm. a crime? I think there's a big difference between something that offends people, which is the inevitable product of public discourse, and saying something that's a, that's a hate incident. There's a big difference between saying something like, I think we should have less immigration, and I think all immigrants are plotting to uh, uh, take over the country. Okay, but what if you say that you think a biological man mm -hmm. who dresses up as a woman is a man? Well, if you then go on, as many people who say that do, to say, because they're a paedophile, then no, that's no, no, a hate no, no, incident. No, 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 but if you, you just, if you say, my, the courts have been very clear, if you say, my view is, is that uh, gender is binary, well, that's something the courts have been very clear isn't a hate incident. Um, if you say, my, my view is that gender is binary and people only, uh, uh, and trans people are just dressing up as men so they can assault women or just dressing up as men for sexual pleasure or because they're paedophiles, then you're crossing then into you're crossing hate crime I'm going to give you the final word, Tessa, Well, I'm just briefly. interested, Sam, I think what's triggered this and one of the reasons why the Conservatives are claiming it is because of the marches and the explosion of interest in Gaza and the peace protests, etc. And I want to know, the projections onto the Houses of Parliament, you know, from the river to the sea. Is this hate? Because there seems to be a very grey area. 